like my life has been completely taken over by my children and they're too young to appreciate it. So I feel completely underappreciated. Like I am just the hired help here to serve. And you know, some days that's okay. And some days it's not. <laughs> Now that's how Maggie Sprague, a business owner who had to close her hair salon because of COVID-19 felt, a common feeling of everyday women around the world prior to the current pandemic had a level of autonomy in pursuing their aspirations. Now that's coming up. Also coming up, I will be joined by special guests from KTN in Nairobi, Quinton Boris Saina, and Najma Ismail, host of the new show, Her Standards. You don't wanna miss this. This is Our Voices, and I'm Oriani Tangishaka. Welcome to the conversation. Women worldwide have been working hard to attain independence in many areas of their lives. However, COVID-19 is not only come to threaten their health, but also their advancement as key contributors to families and societies. Let's begin by taking a look at the challenges of a salon owner here in Washington, D.C. area as she tries to maintain her status as a business owner and her responsibilities at home during the coronavirus pandemic. Before the pandemic, I had a booming business. I work in my home. I have a really, really nice base of ladies that come in here. And I don't know that it'll be the same again ever. Normally I have a few people in at once and the conversations start and you sort of feel like you're with your girlfriends. I miss the salon terribly. I miss my clients. I love the people that I work with. You have to read it, sweetie. I read it in my mind. No, you gotta read it out loud. No, I don't have to. Since the pandemic, I haven't seen any clients. I spend most of my days cooking and cleaning and folding laundry and cleaning again and making beds. I have three little kids. I'm trying to school them, which is not easy. I think I've about given up on schooling the three-year-old. I feel like my life has been completely taken over by my children and they're too young to appreciate it. So I feel completely underappreciated, like I am just the hired help here to serve. So the last morning that I saw clients, I thought, you know, I'm gonna have to come up with some idea for my clients to be able to touch their hair up. People are still working, they're still doing Zoom, you're still being seen and no woman wants to look in a video camera or a computer at herself and see roots and feel horrible. Yeah, hi, Maggie. Hi. Is your hair nice and wet? It's wet. What so I came up with this idea to do custom color kits at a reduced cost and simple instructions where I could FaceTime my clients or Zoom with them at home and walk them through it. So it was a lot less scary than if you were to go buy a box from the grocery store, not knowing what you're putting on your head and then guessing how you put it on. I don't prefer it. I prefer to have contact with people and the normal line of communication but, um, you know, it's not terrible. At least I get to see people. Their personalities still come through on Zoom. <laughs> My business will survive this. One of the reasons is that I don't have rent to pay because I manage my salon out of my home. I do have a mortgage um, and my income is relevant. We are a dual income family, but we'll survive this. Um, the kids, because I have such a large client base to begin with, I have more of an audience of people to sell my kits to. Now similar, in Africa, experts say that in the face of the human and economic crisis caused by COVID-19, existing gender inequalities in the economic opportunities may worsen, similar to the large-scale health shocks that occurred in the 2014 Ebola pandemic. 
In Liberia, women experienced the worst job losses and remained out of work longer than men since women worked disproportionately in the hardest hit sectors. To discuss these experiences and more, very special guests are joining me today. Our colleagues at Standard Groups in Nairobi, Quinton Borisaina and Najma Ismail, the beautiful faces of the recently launched women's show, Her Standards. I begin by asking them, after watching Mary Prague's story, how has the COVID-19 been affecting them and how do they feel? Wow. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, it has been one eventful ride, really not what I expected at the beginning of the year, but it's just been a journey full of new beginnings and new lessons. It's been challenging, you know, shocking and challenging. Mm, that, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to dive deep into that. Najma, you are mm -hmm. a journalist, a wife, a mother. Uh, can you briefly mm -hmm. tell us how COVID-19 has hindered your performance in either of those responsibilities, you know, as a woman? Wow. Well, I... I feel like COVID has, you know, limited my interactions with adults. Yes, I do have my husband in the house, but I miss having my colleagues and, you know, talking to them, comparing notes, picking their brains, you know, going to the field, getting stories. I feel like um, I'm insignificant right now because I'm not out there. I'm just inside my house, although they appreciate me. I don't feel appreciated the way I used to be. I used to feel when I, I was out there at work. Like um, having to homeschool my children, I had to pull uh, two of them out of the uh, online classes because I couldn't handle it, you know. Like there are two young ones who couldn't stand being in the same room because, you know, this one's reading out loud and the other one cannot read out loud and, and all the time they needed my attention. So I, I had to pull them out of it and just, you know, give them work on my own. Mm -hmm. So it's really been challenging having to constant, to juggle between work, home and my mental health, you know, trying to process this whole thing. Mm. And for you, Quinter, uh, I mean, you are also a journalist, you're also a mother, you're also a wife, and of course, you're also a leader of an organization, Women Kenya. Uh, have you seen any regression emotionally um, from the women that you work with in all those areas? Looking at the amount of pressure that we are dealing with right now, we are trying to be perfect in both worlds. You're trying to be the perfect mothers at home and wives. You're also trying to be, you know, the trailblazers at the place of work. and. The pressure is just intense and you can pick it out from different conversations. Now at Standard Group, for example, yeah, we have social media platforms where we communicate with one another. And from time to time, you're able to pick out, you know, the, how women are training, you know, they, they bring up conversations about raising their children, they bring out conversations the about their well comes out, huh? <laughs> their mental health. So it's just what COVID-19 has done is it has dealt us a big blow. We really didn't see it coming. Mm. And, you know, women already, uh, even before COVID-19, you were already disadvantaged. You were doing more work. Mm -hmm. There were already expectations from the society. We had something called the primary roles where you expected to excel, you know, mm -hmm. in your in your area as, as a mother mm -hmm. in the home front. So I, I just hope that we, this will be able to come to an end in the near future. That's right. And also for you, Najma, if you don't mind me just putting my glasses on, how can you address these issues? I mean, we are facing these issues on a daily basis during the pandemic as women. Are there things that are, you know, that we can do to reinvent ourselves, as you've said? Uh, or will you just wait for the pandemic to pass, to go back to life as usual? Absolutely not. You can't wait for the pandemic to pass. You know, you have to be relevant. You have to add value to your organization because um, uh, organizations right now are letting go of their employees left, right and center. And you don't want to be among the people who are going to be, you know, fired because, you know, the organization is not making money. So you need to, you know, it, it reinvent yourself, find ways of maybe if you're in the media, create content, show your employer that you're valuable, that even he, if there's no money, but this is a valuable employee, we have to keep this one also maybe at home or you know you can just try and if you're fortunate enough to have like a home garden you can you can grow some you know vegetables sell them to your neighbors you know try and make that extra buck you know extra shilling yeah exactly. shilling here in kenya just don't <laughs> stay there you know don't say that i'm waiting it off i want to wait until covid no you'll be the only one because people are finding new ways of how to cope and deal with this pandemic and how to move on but if you just stay there and say you're not going to do anything i mean it's everyone it's affecting everyone it's affecting everyone but everyone is reacting different to this pandemic mm. 
Well, Najma, you did mention about reinventing yourself. Um, can you give us an example of how you are reinventing yourself? Um, I recently started a show online that's called Life in Isolation, mm -hmm. um, where I, I bring in an expert like a psychologist and we talk about the mental health issues and he gets to answer some of the questions. Mm -hmm. So this is really amazing. We've got an amazing feedback and now we're using um, our platform because we have the online, we have TV, we have radio and print. Um, we can put that show in any of those platforms. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's what I did. Fantastic. Quinter, how about you? Any examples? Yes, uh, extremely exciting news. We launched, uh, recently launched a show about women called Her Standards. Yes, and uh, what, yes, yes I, we, we were just, we were trying to remain relevant in the in the wake of COVID-19 because women are affected in so many ways and we were looking for a platform where we would be able to amplify the issues of, uh, you know, women and, and of course men, actually, you cannot run away from that. <laughs> right. So. Uh, her standards. I am hosting with Najma, who yes. is actually here today. Yes. It's it's so exciting, actually. We can't wait to have the next one. So yes, I think the uh, moral of the story is look at available opportunities and just tap into it. It doesn't matter what it is. That That is the only one I can give to women out there. All hope is not lost. There is there's something that every woman can do. Yeah. What can What is it that you can add to your uh, your skill set so that you are more marketable say to the next employer mm -hmm. are you able to acquire skills online there are so many of them right now mm -hmm. and they are they are for free so all you need to do is just do not give up i mean you people have lost jobs yes but life must go on that's right okay so you need to figure out reinvent yourself mm -hmm. take advantage of opportunities that are, are available for you that is so awesome that's so awesome it just came to mind that I recently, though, when you talk about reinventing yourself, I recently signed up. Uh, I was trying to sign up for uh, a Red Cross volunteering. You know, oh. you guys are talking about um, starting a home garden. I've thought about that as well. Um, and you know, I was like, you know, volunteering with the Red Cross really teaches you different skills, different life skills. You know, when mm. you volunteer. So you know, I'm I'm uh, happy you guys are, are mentioning that because I just remember that I was thinking mentally I need to be challenged yeah. more, and so yeah. signing up for uh, I don't know, an organization that has volunteering uh, opportunities, I think will be great, great um, thing to you add know, to ourselves. The other thing is um, not just Red Cross. There are so many charitable organizations where people can volunteer. We have organ things like uh, Rotary. You know, we have uh, many well, other uh, non-governmental organizations mm. that people can be actively involved in. So that, that you find a way of, you know, uh, get, <coughs> get a life but also impact the community don't just be a whiner be somebody who is looking for who is able to provide solutions mm. true, true. Well, ladies, i agree with quinta yeah well ladies this conversation has been so fruitful and so empowering and encouraging i thank you so so much for taking the time to talk with us here on our voices we look forward to much more conversation that can empower and encourage women do, during these difficult times we really appreciate it now we have to take a quick break. When we return, we'll look at some solutions that can help women as they strive to excel in the midst of difficult circumstances. We'll look at examples of what some women are doing in Nigeria and in Zimbabwe. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Being part of Our Voices is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. Welcome back, You With Our Voices. We're discussing ways of staying in power during a pandemic. What are things that some of us can do to mitigate the impact of the coronavirus pandemic in Nigeria, VOA's Arashad Arasabadi brings us a story of a produce delivery business in Lagos, which helps women avoid public markets and exposure to the coronavirus. However, these ventures can often generate backlashes in countries where women are battling for equality or simply cultural norms that can threaten their ability to feed their families. Take a look. In most Nigerian homes, women buy the food and prepare the meals. 
By packing and delivering produce, Easy Shop Easy Cook says it saves women time by bringing the market to their doors and helps them stay healthy by observing social distancing. Owner Sadat Salami says her business also enables women to pursue their own jobs and careers. But not everyone thinks this is a good idea. We encounter hostility every day. When we put out our adverts, the, the comments under it, you hear that um, you are too lazy. Why are you allowing someone to, to buy food for you? You are too lazy. This Calabar woman is going to come and take your, your husband from you. Why are you allowing that to happen? You know, we get that every day. Salami has been in business over 14 years. She says comments online often accuse her of eroding traditional gender roles. She says that thinking is outdated and that more women should be in business and in government. The more women that are in the National Assembly, we will see things from the perspective and we will have laws in place and they can force companies and institutions to be able to recognize that this is a woman, these are her changes, uh, challenges and this is how we're going to include the woman in whatever we're doing. And she's not alone. Funmi Ogboy founded the Women in Energy Network to put more female faces in the country's oil industry. She says barriers must fall for women to have a chance in business. We're just not there. We're not there in enough numbers because um, cultural reasons as well as just not having that access to financing. One global consultancy says that at current rates, it would take 142 years for African women to reach parity. Meanwhile, women in Nigeria make up less than 6% of the legislature, and no woman has ever served as a state governor. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News, Washington. Now we go to Zimbabwe, where some women in the country's rural communities are earning money with an electric motorcycle. Aboard this custom adult-sized tricycle called the Hamba, village healthcare worker Pamizi Mutanya delivers medical care that may very well save lives. The Hamba made it easier to take patients to and from the hospital. Now, fewer women give birth at home due to lack of transportation, like it used to be. Mutanya drives an average of four people per day to a health clinic while also picking up medicine for others. She started using a Hamba last year and says women pay about $15 a month as a group to lease the ride. Hamba pilot coordinator Fadzai Mavhuna. Women in the rural areas carry the burden of carrying firewood, going to fetch water to drink, and carrying school kids to the school. So as Mobility for Africa, we saw that we need to lessen the burden on women. Transportation startup Mobility for Africa runs the business side of the Hamba. Drivers say the service changed their lives. We used to carry firewood on our heads for two kilometers. Now it's much easier as this tricycle has taken away the burden. Reusable batteries charged by the sun power the Hamba and fuel it for one dollar or less. It has a cruising range of about 100 kilometers. The project is targeted to rural women, so we have noticed that it's not everyone who can afford to buy it. So we are going to sell it to those who can afford to buy it, but at the same time we will continue leasing. Mobility for Africa is now in the second phase of its pilot project. The next step is going commercial, where the Hamba will sell for $1,500. I spoke with Shana Bloman, the director of Mobility for Africa, the organization producing these electric motorcycles. I began by asking her the impact of this project, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. So essentially the project is designed to give women um, mobility. So we have, um, we're using something, a, a tricycle that originally originated from China that we are now adapting for Africa. It's run on green energy. We're working on the battery technology to make it better. And essentially the idea is that women can use it for last mile transport. So as we know, they often have to walk long distances to get water, to get firewood, to get to the market, to get to the health service. So what we've seen is that one, women of course are smart and they can use this um, and they're using it in groups together for practical income generating activities, but also to improve the quality of life. 
Yes. In COVID, we've seen a huge demand for transport because people in rural areas have been basically isolated. Mm -hmm. Often there's a lockdown, no one's going to rural areas, mm -hmm. there's no longer even a combi. So you find there's been basically these people have been stuck with very limited options to get their crops to the to the to the market to get it to a bigger place where it could be sold um, we've also used it we've trained local health workers in the community and they have been doing um, outreach on COVID they have also there was a malaria outbreak and we've got to remember that other diseases don't stop with right. one pandemic That's right. so they were able to help provide and investigate this malaria outbreak um, and the beauty is because it's not dependent on um, petrol, you know, and if we, we, we built a charging station using solar energy, um, we, can, we can guarantee that even if a petrol truck doesn't come, mobility continues. And um, so it's been really exciting. We're still learning a lot. Uh, what are some of the challenges maybe that you're facing that, you know, that's causing some of the women not to be able to come on board? And how are you able to help them to come on board? Um, so we, we have a lot of demand. What we've faced is the challenge of we're, we've got to design a vehicle that's strong and sturdy for off-road. So, you know, because the road conditions are bad. Um, so that's we're trying to look for ways to make the, the vehicles more durable. Uh, we're also trying to find a pay-as-you-go system for women so that more it can be affordable. What we believe is that over time, if you give women more economic opportunity and solve their transport needs, they will increase their income. Mm -hmm. But we know that's going to take a while. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at at the moment is a sliding pay-as-you-go system mm -hmm. where they could buy the tricycle over time, but they could start with smaller amounts as they income, uh, they earn more. And so we're trying to get them to think about how they can use mobility to improve what already may be an existing business, whether they're already, you know, um, selling and trading or they're um, doing horticulture. How do they use that transport to help increase their income as well as the quality of life? How long do you foresee a woman being able to actually um, get to a point where she can earn it after beginning the project? Yeah, look, we're, we're still experimenting the business model, but I think I've spoken to a lot of investors and what really troubles me is that people often say that rural small scale farmers, especially women, are too poor. Mm -hmm. um, and what we know is that they are very resourceful and given a chance, they make things move. Are they able people to make, obtain bank loans, hopefully, to be able to purchase well, them? Looking, we're looking at credit financing now. Um, obviously. You know, the more, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a pyramid, isn't it? So if you reach the bottom, it's people need more help. We have to push yes. because this could be really transformative. And if you, if you come to our project, you will see and the women will tell you, you know, how much it can change their lives. Mm -hmm. So we know they'll pay over time. They're, they're, right. they're trustworthy. They're reliable. You That's know, right. they're, they're, they're a good investment. Now we have to take another quick break, but when we return, we'll share with you a young woman who's a former Taekwondo champion in Senegal, now a talented shoemaker. It's just another example of how women's skills are very versatile. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This is a country that I chose to become a citizen. I didn't have to become a citizen. I chose to become a citizen. I feel like America gave me an opportunity to pursue my passion as an artist. I really believe that clean eating is, is a way to a more successful life or, or a happier life, if, if you want to put it that way. One of the things that helps me wake up every morning is doing better, being better. We grew up poor. And so I'm always focused on helping the working class be able to have a more comfortable lifestyle. I'm passionate about doing justice every day. Um, I oftentimes say that justice is a verb, not a noun. You know, I believe in action and moving the ball forward. Now this week we are sharing with you a woman we are watching in our Women to Watch segment. Baya Batili, 
a shoemaker in a trade traditionally reserved for men. This 27-year-old with a strong temperament is a former Taekwondo champion in Senegal who managed to win despite obstacles. She is now a shoemaker. She is an example of how versatile women's skills can be. Take a look. It's a report by DJ Mary McIntosh for Alison Lakodo Fernandez in Dakar, Senegal. Baya Batili, 27, lives in the Parcel Asani neighborhood for almost 10 years, she practiced high-level Taekwondo until becoming champion of Senegal in 2011. It was her father who encouraged her to practice this combat sport. I was fighting every day at school. Each time my father was called to tell him that I was fighting. And I only fought with men. I always wanted to arm wrestle with the boys. I did not want them to be stronger than me. Passionate about repairing and renovating objects from a young age, Baya is now a shoemaker. Last March, she opened her own boutique at Quoes Foray. She learned the trade five years ago from a shoemaker in the Medina district despite the disapproval of her family and those around her. In Senegal, shoemaking is a profession that is looked down upon. That's why my family didn't want me doing this job. But I thought to myself, this is my passion. I have to overcome all these obstacles to be able to achieve what I want. Today, the situation has changed and the young entrepreneur has managed to win and get the support of her loved ones and also that of some of her clients who admire her determination. And like many others, Baya makes her own products. She designed them herself. And being the first female shoemaker in Senegal, I think we must support her, help her to move forward. Baya would now like to share her know-how. One day, she dreams of setting up a shoemaking school attended by men and women. Deirdre Murray McIntosh for Alison Lukoke Fernandez in Dakar, Senegal. Now that's a woman to watch. And that's where we're going to end it this week. Thanks to our colleagues from Standard Groups in Nairobi, Quentin Bori, Saina, and Najma Ismail for joining us. On behalf of VOA and my colleagues, Ian Bior and Hedy Adams Fitzpatrick here on Our Voices, thank you and stay empowered. <laughs>